bugs. Creepy, crawly, and absolutely essential to life on Earth. Most people try to avoid them, but I've always done the opposite. My name is Jason Miller, naturalist and professional bug nerd. My mission is to inspire curiosity about the most underappreciated and misunderstood animals on the planet and inspire action to preserve and protect them. We may not always love bugs, but we definitely need them. Want to know how? Then let's get bugging. Oh, hey, I have great news for you guys. You can be a bug conservationist. You don't need to be a scientist. You don't even really need a diploma. You just need to care. Conservation work can seem really intimidating if you look at the big picture and see all the things that need to get done in order for real change to happen. Luckily, bugs are pretty resilient and they can even bounce back from the brink of extinction as long as they're given a chance. Let me tell you a quick story. This is Lord Howe Island, a small island in the Tasman Sea between Australia and New Zealand. And this is the Lord Howe Island phasmid, an eight inch long stick insect that, along with many other species, is found nowhere else on earth. They were very common on the island up until 1918, when a cargo ship ran aground and unintentionally introduced a population of rats that had been living on board. With zero predators in a land area of only five and a half square miles, the rats quickly took over at the expense of native wildlife. By the early 1920s, five birds and 13 insects had disappeared from the island, including the Lord Howe Island phasmid. Fast forward to 1964, two Australian rock climbers named Dave Roots and Rick Higgins traveled to Lord Howe Island with the goal of scaling a sea stack 12 miles off the coast an 1,800-foot-tall shard of stone called Ball's Pyramid. Side note, Ball's Pyramid was named after a man named Henry Ball, not the anatomical... Uh, <clears throat> Ball's Pyramid is a thin volcanic rock with only a few small patches of vegetation, and apart from nesting seabirds, animal life on the island is non-existent. Despite pushback from island officials, Dave and Rick made it to Ball's Pyramid with assistance from a group of locals. During the climb, they found the recently dead remains of a large black insect. They snapped a photo, and upon returning to the mainland, showed the picture to staff at a museum in Sydney, who immediately identified it as the extinct Lord Howe Island phasmid. The discovery made worldwide news, which resulted in an influx of climbers applying for permits to explore Ball's Pyramid under the pretense of searching for more phasmids. The Lord Howe Island Board needed a way to discourage adventure seekers from climbing the dangerous rock and disturbing local seabird nests. So, in 2001, almost 40 years after the discovery, a team of entomologists were enlisted to do a survey of the pyramid to prove once and for all that the phasmid couldn't possibly be surviving there. Nobody on the team was very optimistic about their chances of finding a live specimen. After all, they were searching for an extinct tree-dwelling insect on a rock in the middle of the ocean. It could have been very easy for them to just say, screw it, we looked hard enough, let's all take a nap. But no. These are entomologists, an elite group of nerds who would stop at nothing to get the answers they needed. They're like my Avengers. Searching Ball's pyramid during the day yielded no results. So they set up camp on a ledge near a cluster of shrubs and searched through the night. And you'll never guess what they found. You can probably guess, but it's still very cool. Climbing among the branches in one of the shrubs was a Lord Howe Island phasmid. It was the first live individual seen in almost 80 years, and the team jumped for joy, which under the circumstances wasn't the safest reaction, but still perfectly understandable. A grand total of 24 phasmids were found living on Ball's Pyramid. At the time, that made them the world's rarest insect. A couple years later, a breeding pair was collected and brought to Melbourne Zoo in hopes of building up a captive population. And as of 2019, over 14,000 Lord Howe Island phasmids have been bred at Melbourne Zoo. On top of that, San Diego Zoo and Bristol Zoo also now have breeding populations. The next step is reintroduction to Lord Howe Island, which should be happening within the next year or so thanks to an island-wide rodent extermination in 2019. 
There's still some uncertainty about the likelihood of successfully repopulating Lord Howe Island with these incredible insects, but uncertainty is the reality of conservation work. When the two rock climbers found a dead insect on Ball's Pyramid, they had no idea they had just taken the first step in a half century long journey of resurrecting a dead species. But they did. The team of entomologists who went searching on Ball's Pyramid in the middle of the night, scaling cliffs, didn't have to risk their lives like that for a bug that no one believed could still be alive. But they did. To this day, we really don't know how the phasmids got from Lord Howe Island to Ball's Pyramid 15 miles away, but they did. The fact that these events all took place within this cloud of uncertainty is proof of two things. Number one, giving up hope is never an option. And number two, anyone can be a conservationist, as long as you care enough to go the extra mile. And luckily, bug conservation is a lot easier than you might expect. Redefine the word pest. Consider if the bug that's in your house or in your yard is actually a threat to you, or if you just want to kill it because it's creepy. Chill out with pesticide use, especially ones that include neonicotinoids because they stay in the ecosystem for years and years. I know how tempting it can be to just grab an all-purpose insect killer and spray it all over your entire garden, but trust me, there are plenty of organic pest control methods that cost much less in the long run. Know where your food comes from. Grow it yourself if you can, but if you can't, buy from local organic farmers instead of big name brands. You'll be decreasing commercial pesticide use and supporting your local economy. And pay special attention to farmers that practice hydroponics or regenerative farming. Those guys are the real MVPs. Mow your lawn less. Let weeds grow. You're not only providing habitat for ground dwelling insects, but you're providing a food source for pollinators. If you see dandelions or thistle growing in your lawn, let them grow. Because it's usually the first meal that a bumblebee or a butterfly will have in the spring. Not only does this affect native pollinators, but the overall biodiversity of your yard will increase. You could wake up to songs by birds you've never even heard before. Finally, view biodiversity as a commodity. Act as if increasing the overall biodiversity on your property increases your property value. Observe what lives around you and how it all connects to each other, how every organism interacts. Humans are a part of the ecosystem just as much as ants and caterpillars are. And the more that we try to control and simplify the natural world around us, the worse off we're gonna be in the long run. There's a strange mindset that we don't have to take serious action on environmental issues because things just aren't bad enough yet. But putting out a fire on the top floor of a building is much less expensive than waiting until the entire thing is burned down and has to be rebuilt from the beginning. Bugs are a fact of life. They've inhabited this planet for hundreds of millions of years and will more than likely still be here hundreds of millions of years in the future. Bugs can live without us but we can't live without them. They keep the world as we know it alive and balanced. They may occasionally invade our homes or drink our blood, but they also feed us, teach us lessons in cooperation and innovation, and transform death into the ingredients for new life. Will we ever realistically drive all bugs to extinction? Not likely. But if biodiversity continues to decrease, it won't be their extinction. It'll be ours. We are at a pivotal point in human evolution. We can either continue working against nature, or we can work with it. We can prioritize learning more about our effect on the ecosystem instead of trying to control things that we don't really understand. We are a single species holding an enormous amount of power. And what we do with that power is up to every one of us. No pressure. Until next time, I've been Jason. And we've been bugging.